What follows may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. The world is full of stories. Stories of mysteries. Of curiosities. Of oddities. Join Cat and Jethro Gilligan-Toth for the strange, the bizarre, the unexpected, as they lift the lid and cautiously peer inside the box of oddities. This is weird. My stomach hurts. This is weird for a number of reasons. Number one, this is the first regular Box of Oddities show that we have uh, filmed. Yeah. Um, So we had to build a studio, which welcome to. Thank you for joining us in our studio slash landing area in our apartment. Um, This is my bookshelf. That's JG's bookshelf. This is where I keep the towels um, right here. (laughs) (laughs) It's because my bathroom's like right right here. And uh, Lukey has uh has found a place that uh, he he finds very comfortable yeah. uh, right at the uh, edge of our table so it works out okay so if this goes well we are planning on releasing video episodes on YouTube and um, hopefully it will go well we will see what do you mean by well though what is that how do you gauge well I don't um, know. yeah I don't know either oh also wanted to give you a heads up that uh, downstairs there is a random dog um, so if you hear some activity it's the random dog that we have downstairs our life is so weird um in fact today twice already cat has said uh, please hammer don't hurt them understand that Sorry either. About that. It's okay. I love you anyway. <laughs> I'm super excited to get started. I want to know how this is going to sound, how it's going to feel. I'm hoping that as we go along, I will become less anxious. I don't, we did a little test yesterday and I was going to wear the same outfit today and I couldn't because I was sweating and I don't know what's <laughs> wrong with me. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. I've done this before. What's I wrong was, with me? I was so nervous. Mm. We, oh, I had to throw my shirt away. <laughs> I just gave up on it. All right, let's go. All right. Let's rewind to the late 1800s in Sweden, where a young girl named Carolina Olsen was, she was just an ordinary girl living on a secluded island called Akno with her four brothers. And life was simple, nothing out of the ordinary until one fateful day in the winter of 1876. Okay. Christina was a bright-eyed 14-year-old girl with her whole life in front of her. And was her name Christina? Carolina. Not, not, not Christina Olsen. She was a bright-eyed 14-year-old. She had her whole life ahead of her. And she's walking home from school on the snow-covered paths, the island that she lives in. The air was chilly. It nipped in her cheeks. But she didn't mind. She was kind of lost in her thoughts. Plus, she was probably used to it. Probably grew up sleeping outside. Yeah, as a baby. Yeah. That's right. Sweden. Just as she rounded the corner, though, she stepped on some ice, and it was covered with a thin layer of snow. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who have lived in the types of environments that provide those conditions, know how- Treacherous. Yeah. Yeah. Because- Ice is slippery, but then you put a fine dusting of of snow on top of it. It can be deadly. And that's what she slipped on. Time seemed to slow down as Carolina found herself in the middle of slipping and falling. It's weird how that happens. I just saw a study on that. I'll tell you about it later. But (laughs) in in our mind, it does. Time does slow down when, when you're threatened. Her head hit the pavement with a sickening thud. It was um, a pretty bad fall. Yeah. More than knocked the wind out of her. It left her dazed and disoriented. And it was the beginning of a journey into the unknown. More than just an injury. This is something that would change the course of her life in ways that she never, never could have imagined. 
Now, this is new because we're not used to having cameras here. Yeah. You've made it very dramatic and, and you looked right, right at, at the, the camera, camera. Yeah. just now. I'm, I want, should I be looking at the, hello? <laughs> okay. Little did she know as she lay there on the cold ground that this fall would set into motion a series of events that would baffle the medical community, not just the medical professionals, but uh, her family and it would captivate the world's attention. Was she concussed? Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure she was, but there was no definite uh, medical diagnosis that I could find. <clears throat> she was clearly disoriented from the impact, and she pulls herself up off the ground and stumbles back to her house. Upon arriving, she hopes that, uh, you know, maybe she could lay down and things would get better. No, that's bad when you have a concussion. That's what they say. Word. I love the word uh, concuss. I can't say it, but I love it. So she goes to sleep. Yeah. she Her head is spinning. She's got a headache, of course. She's feeling nauseated. Um, so she curls up in her bed to take a little bit of a nap. And again, this was late afternoon in uh, February. She pulls the blankets up over her and falls asleep. But then something strange happens. Carolina doesn't wake up. She doesn't wake up for dinner. She died? No. No, she just she just sleeping? sleeping. And her family let her sleep. Next morning, they went in to wake her up. She's still alive, mm -hmm. but still asleep. And then the next day after that, she's still asleep. She slept for days? It went on and on and on. The days turned to weeks. The weeks to months. Seasons came and seasons went. People grew older. And Carolina remained in this state of profound sleep. Was she just sleeping, though? I mean, that doesn't sound like that nor Normally, you wake up Normally from sleep. You do wake up. <laughs> and that's the weird thing about this is clearly back in, in, in those days, state of the art in the medical um, industry or community was, was not you know, quite as advanced as, as it is today or anywhere near adva as advanced. Right. And so they thought it was a coma, but it seemed maybe they were, they were calling it um, animated, sus uh, suspended animation. Okay. But they couldn't figure out what was possibly happening. They tried all kinds of tests. I was just going to ask, like, how hard did they try to wake her up? Like, they tried pretty hard. Like, Carolina! <laughs> Carolina's condition uh, stayed the same, and life went on around her. And I, I'm thinking about the family. Um, they must have been just beside themselves. They did lovingly care for Carolina, and uh, they would bathe her yeah. daily. They somehow managed to keep her fed. Ovaltine, I bet. Yeah, yeah probably Ovaltine. Yeah. yeah. And they rallied around her, and they scraped together enough money to take her to see some doctors okay. that were of no help whatsoever. Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> they took the money. But uh, they were just as baffled as everybody else. Was, was it a coma? Was it suspended animation? They couldn't quite put their finger on it. Now, Caroline, Carolina's case um, is, is pretty mind-blowing. She's been in this deep slumber, and it's continuing to go on and on and on. You'd think her body would waste away. It didn't. Ovaltine. Do you think it was the Ovaltine? Yeah. This is a great commercial for Ovaltine. I know. The weird thing is, muscles will atrophy. Yeah. I remember when I was in the hospital, I was in, I, granted, I was, I was pretty ill, and so that weakened me, but I was in bed for two weeks, and I remember getting up to try to go and turn the television channel uh, by myself, and 
my, with your hand because you didn't have a remote. We didn't have those back then. The no, it was a coal burning TV set. Yeah. And so I, uh, I got out of bed. I hopped out of bed like I normally would and just collapsed because my legs had started to atrophy after two weeks. That sounds awful. It was terrible. And I ended up having to watch some soap opera as the world turns or something and, uh, and then try to get back into bed before the nurses scolded me. Sure. But Carolina, not the case. Her body seemed to defy all of the laws of nature. She wasn't atrophying? She wasn't. And, and she, at this point, it had been a couple few years. Despite being in a state of suspended animation, her, her weight remained stable. It's like her body had this magical ability to maintain itself even without her being conscious of it. Huh. And yes, they were feeding her. Right. But even that, if you're in bed for years, yeah. your muscles are going to atrophy. Now, let's talk about her hair and her fingernails. How often do you get a haircut? Uh, it depends on how deep into seasonal depression I am. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I average... Four weeks. Four, three to four weeks. Yeah. yeah. My fingernails, my nails here in, in, in Ecuador, for some reason, are growing faster than ever. I'm, yeah, you trim your nails like every six days. At least. It, probably more than that. So you would expect that they would have to trim her nails and cut her hair. Yeah. But they didn't. Her hair did not grow. Her nails stayed the same. It just stopped growing. That's really weird. It's like her body just hit pause. Now, I have to say that the idea of my hair stopping growing and my nails staying where they are. Mm -hmm. That upsets you. No, it, uh, it, sounds, it sounds glorious. I wouldn't have to go to the barber. And get a haircut. You like going to the barber. Well, he does give you a free scotch, which yeah. is one of the benefits, again, of living in a town like this. But it would just make life so much easier. Sure. It, it reminds me of my Aunt Doris, who she was in her later years and, and her hair was thinning and her eyebrows, all of her eyebrows, what little bit didn't fall out were so fine and yeah. light colored. You couldn't see them. So she had them removed completely and then new ones tattooed on. Oh, wow. When was this? Uh, this would have been probably late 80s. That's pretty advanced for yeah. the 80s, right? I, I don't so. know a lot of people doing cosmetic tattooing in the 80s. Well, she didn't go to a, a reputable tattoo artist um, and he kind of hurried through the job. So she sadly lived the last few lives. Uh, sadly, she lived the last few years of her life uh, just looking surprised. It's, it's really a sad story. Oh, Doris. My Aunt Doris. Mm. So no haircuts, no nail trims. Right. It's the kind of thing that you'd expect to hear uh, in a science fiction movie, but, right. but this really happened. There she was. It really does sound like suspended emanation. It does. And it, uh, it certainly for, by local standards, it, it broke all the rules of biology. They were bewildered. <clears throat> so six years go by. Six years. Yeah. And they hear of a specialist in another town outside their village. Okay. And they think, all right, we're going to go. We're going to take her. We're going to see if maybe this guy, um, because all doctors were guys, you know, back then, um, can figure something out. What's going on here? Now, while they did this, sadly, one of her brothers passed away. And so while she was being observed by, by this doctor, um, they told her, you know, she was still quote, yeah. sound asleep. Uh, they told her that her brother had passed away and tears started to form. So she was aware of what was going on? It seemed to be the case, but they weren't sure. Was she locked in? 
ultimately that question will be answered. Okay. But even with all of their fancy equipment at this uh, new doctor's office, they did electroshock therapy. They did the cold water submersion. You that know, just seems mean. It's awful. Nothing woke her up. The doctors were stumped. They couldn't explain why Carolina had been asleep for so long or why her body seemed to be in this state of suspended animation. They, they even gave her a diagnosis of dementia paralytica. Uh, which is a form of paralysis linked to dementia. But um, that didn't quite fit the bill either. They actually gave her some medicine that what they used for that condition, and it didn't do anything. So, years go by. 32 of them, in fact. 32 years? In 1908, Carolina woke up. What? Yeah, she just suddenly started stirring, and the family Why came like, in. Someone making pancakes? <laughs> the room, the room, silent. Yeah, you know. And then they hear her stirring after thirty-two years, and members of the family that had survived ran in to see her eyes fluttering, and then she just opened them. And acted like she had just woken up from a nap. What? After years of watching their daughter tending to her every need, her family must have uh, just been stunned. That's unreal. Hardly daring to believe what they were what they were singing. But she was there. She was responding to them, blinking back as if nothing had happened. Did she? Did she recognize that thirty two years had passed? No. Oh. <gasps> No, she did not. Not at first. She just had a little nap. She just had a little nap. And woke up and her parents were elderly. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. Oof. And here's the, I mean, there's a lot of weird things, but here's another weird thing. Um, she did not appear to have aged. She still, in their minds, looked 14 years old. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. That's that's the story. And there are pictures of her before and after. Um, and uh, they're, of course, very primitive pictures and grainy. And she, the after photo, mm -hmm. after she woke up, she does look a lot younger than 46. Right. Which is what she would have been, I, if my math is correct, and rarely is it. Um. But uh, she had no recollection. It wasn't like time passed. She said it was like she laid down for a nap. Wow. And woke up. And she'd been teleported into the future by 32 years. Can we see these pictures? Yes. Yes, we can. This was shortly after she... Um, oh, it will be here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because yeah. this is just... A green square right now. This, oh, okay. This is a picture of her uh, right after she woke up, and 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 she does look much younger than she is. I wouldn't say fourteen. Okay. And how did she make her living after this? Did she go back to school? Yeah. No, not really. No. She, no, she became like this local sensation, and well, then I mean, a regional. At that time, that was pretty average for dumping out of school, anyway. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. She made her living uh, exploiting this. Nice. Uh, she went on tour. She talked about it. She had postcards made of her standing in front of the house that she slept in for 32 years. Wow. And sold them. And she lived until 1950. So like almost four more decades. Wow. Yeah. And she was quite active right up until the end. I well, she'd slept for like 40 years. Got, so got a lot of a lot of rest. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the story. Wow. Strange, huh? That is super strange. 32 years. Her hair and nails stopped growing. She didn't lose any weight. And when she woke up 32 years later, she just got up and went about her life. 
went to business making postcards, making them dollars. Yep. I love it. Way to go, Carolina. I got this information from uh, Medium Magazine. Very cool. Yeah. So what have you got for me? In the early hours of 2014, January 24th, Miriam Rodriguez received a devastating phone call from her daughter, Azalea. Probably the worst call that you could get from a child. Um, Azalea told her mom that Miriam's other daughter, her 20-year-old, Karen, had been abducted. Now, as if that's not bad enough, Azalea revealed that the kidnappers were part of the Zeta drug cartel. And they demanded $77,000. That's an oddly specific number. It is a very specific number, yeah. Now, Miriam's daughters lived in San Fernando, Tamalupas, Mexico. I don't think I pronounced that right. Miriam was living and working as a housekeeper in Texas at the time. But her daughters had stayed back in Mexico to run the family business. So in 2014, in this part of Mexico, particularly areas like San Fernando, that was a weird thing my voice just did, San Fernando, it was a hotspot for being um, organized crime, drug cartel activity, a lot was going on. Kidnappings happened a lot, and often they were carried out by criminal organizations, unfortunately not uncommon during this region or during this time in this region. Or during now. There's a lot of this going on now. Or during now. Or during now. Which is... Or during now. I sounded Canadian again, didn't I? A little bit. I liked it. Yeah. So the group responsible for Karen's kidnapping, the Mexican crime syndicate known as the Zetas, organized in 1997, and it was... They were part of another group. They um, were more of an enforcement division that was connected to the Gulf Cartel. Okay. The Zeta group does not sound to me like a drug cartel enforcement agency. Yeah. It, it sounds like a fraternity. It sounds like they should be holding a kegger. Yeah. No. Now, let's go over to the Zetas. It's not, it's not that intimidating, uh, really, when you think about it. No. But then again, you know, gangs, and it, we'll get into it. It's fine. But by 2010, the Zetas had become autonomous, and they were distinct from their original affiliations. Keep in mind, gangs typically offer a sense of belonging for right, people right. Who, who don't have that. It gives them a sense of identity. And it's often those who come from poverty and don't have positive influences in their community. And they, they seek out this feeling of belonging importance, and it's exploited. Often they'll commit and turn a blind eye to crimes and violence to maintain that sense of connection and belonging. It's, it's quite sad. And quite common. Oh, gosh, yes. So 20-year-old Karen was driving through San Fernando when two trucks approached her and armed individuals forcefully entered her vehicle and drove away with her. Following the abduction, the Rodriguez family dedicated weeks to bringing her back. They were aware that they had been captured by the Zetas cartel and they knew that it was a very dangerous situation to be involved in. So they paid the ransom right away. There was, they took out a loan. They left a bag at the drop-off point, but Karen was not returned. And in the following days, the kidnappers contacted Miriam again, demanding additional ransom. And from what I read, this is sometimes the case when a ransom is paid too quickly. It appears to the kidnappers like, oh, well, this was no problem for you, so you shouldn't have problems getting more. And, and you can't go back to them and say, hey, we had an agreement. Right. They don't care. It's a drug cartel. They're probably, I don't know, maybe they're not that familiar with business ethics. Yeah. 
That's probably it. So they demanded additional ransom. Miriam paid it. But despite her cooperation, Karen was still not returned. Miriam even arranged meetings with individuals of the gang. They claimed that they were they were part of the group, and to her surprise, they agreed to meet her, and including one guy named Sama. Now he said he didn't know where Karen was, but he offered assistance to retrieve her for a fee of two thousand dollars, of course. Mm-hmm. Karen was still not returned. So after a month, Miriam resigned herself to the idea that her daughter was dead. So with over 70,000 individuals reported missing in Mexico and law enforcement showing little interest, Miriam was convinced that her daughter was dead. And she shared this with her surviving child, with Azalea. She said, you know, I'm sure your sister's dead, but I will not stop until we find out who did this. And she said, for the rest of my life, for the rest of the time I have, I'm going to find the people who did this to my daughter and I'm going to make them pay. Well, I love a good revenge story. Right? Yeah. I just wish that uh, there hadn't been innocent death. Yeah. Who likes a need for it? No one. No. So Miriam had a reputation for combating crime. In 1989, she hunted down thieves who had raided her husband's safe and retrieved all of the stolen goods. And another time, she directly intervened to protect her daughter's husband from gang threats, even paying a small ransom to make the problem go away. Wow. Her children joked that um, she secretly desired to be a cop, but she wasn't corrupt enough to qualify. (laughs) A true vigilante. So Miriam's kind of badass. <laughs> she did have a lead on Sama, though. She found Sama through Facebook. And going through all of his friends on Facebook, she recognized one of the outfits that one of his friends was wearing. She knew that that was a uniform for a very specific ice cream shop. So she found this person who worked at this ice cream shop. She went there and she waited outside for weeks. Oh, my God. Until she spotted Sama. Thereafter, she followed him closely, and so it began. That's some pretty decent detective work. She's... (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So, uh, assisted by Lewis, her ex-husband, slash Azalea and Karen's father, Miriam dedicated two years to pursuing the captors, laying traps involving law enforcement only when she was certain that there would be an arrest made and that it could be stuck. You know, um, what's the term they use? Make sure it can stick. You know, the law and order. Yeah, they can prosecute. Yeah. Right. Prosecutable crime. That's right. Why can't I think of the guy's name from Law and Order? Which one? Oh, well, I keep thinking. (laughs) (laughs) I keep thinking George Orwell. (laughs) George Orwell. And I know it's not right. Jerry Orbach. There we go. It's the same sounds. And it, okay. She, Miriam went about the towns of the, the people that she was hunting down, disguised as a pollster, as a healthcare worker, as an election official. She altered her appearance so that people wouldn't recognize her. She extracted names and addresses. She met with unsuspecting relatives for vital information. She documented everything meticulously. And she had a black computer bag that she kept everything in. She eventually tracked down so many people who were involved. Now, despite numerous rejections from local, state, and federal authorities. She persisted, and she kept reaching out. And finally, a sympathetic federal officer was moved by her dedication and extensive, extensive documentation. So this federal policeman was willing to assist. (laughs) And he was quoted as saying, I have never seen anything like this. When she pulled out her files onto the table, the details and information gathered by this woman working all by herself, it was incredible. 
Though Sama escaped arrest the first time, the police were able to eventually track him down and detain him. He gave the name of a few other people who shed even more light on the situation, and Miriam went to work. They were able to find out where Karen had, in fact, been killed. Now, Miriam went to this ranch where the informant had said that Karen was murdered. There she found Karen's scarf and a cushion from her truck. And unfortunately, one of her femur bones. This only fuels Miriam. Miriam went to Aldama, the hometown of another one of the gang members, to visit with his grandma. The elderly woman said that her boy had always been in trouble, but at least now he was going to church. And Miriam's like, "Mm mm-hmm. That's not the only place he's going to be going. Naturally, Miriam started attending services. Yep. When authorities arrived and apprehended this gang member within the chapel, the congregation was astounded. And apparently some of the parishioners were pleading with Miriam for clemency, to which she responded, where was his mercy when he killed my daughter? Right. You know, that kind of quiets People who are like, why? Why arrest him? Um, Because he deserves it. He killed somebody. That's normally the tradition. I think so. Now, this is how she continued until 2016, when she tracked down a man known as the florist. Again, not super intimidating. No, no. Uh, It's a well-decorated keg party. (laughs) Now, this is... The last of Karen's abductors, every single one of them had been brought to justice. Four were in prison awaiting a trial. Six were dead, killed by raid incidents. And through her relentless efforts, Karen, Karen's mother had managed to locate uh, her main captor, eventually leading to the unraveling of that section of the cartel. That network because of Miriam. Miriam also established the Colectivo de Desperacidos de San Fernando, the Vanished Collective, a support network for 600 families. Holy crap. Being their lost loved ones. That is an incredible legacy. She's incredible. Yeah. In... March of 2017, 29 inmates orchestrated an escape from a penitentiary in Victoria Ciudad. This is the same facility where Karen's abductors had been held. They um, tunneled out. Concerned for her safety, Miriam reached out for protection, and government authorities did agree um, to provide her protection. They would put patrols on around her house and around where she was working at the time, but it wasn't enough. Late on May 10th, 2017, Miriam finished her shift at the store and made her way home. She was on crutches due to an injury she had sustained chasing after a sex worker who had information about the Zetas. Mm. And um, because she was on crutches, she had difficulty getting out of her car. And while she was hobbling in the street, two men with pistols emerged from a white Nissan truck parked in close proximity. They shot her about a dozen times. Oh, my God. This 57-year-old woman was actually struck eight times. And her husband found her lying in their driveway her crutches strewn by her side with her hand in her purse next to her pistol. Wow. Wow. So Miriam Rodriguez didn't single-handedly change Mexico or the way that they handle crimes, but her actions brought attention to the issue of violence and corruption in the country, and her bravery inspired others to speak out against crime and demand justice, contributing to a broader movement and a change in in Mexico and the way that 
crime is viewed and fought. Now, I got my information from a book that was written by Azam Ahmed called Fear is Just a Word, and it's entirely about Miriam Rodriguez and her flight for justice. Um, the New York la, 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 the New York Times, the New York Post, and all that's interesting.com incredible articles about the work done by Miriam Rodriguez. I think that that is what is called a good death in yeah. some circles. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And she had completed, like, she had this goal. Everyone that was involved in Karen's abduction was going to pay. And they did. She had a little uh, Zeta punch card she was going through. and Yep. And then when she finished off the last one, got a free coffee. Something like that. She was shot eight times. But, um... Oof, yeah. yeah, but amazing woman, incredible story, and, and the fortitude that that would have taken and the time that it took her and the fact that she just didn't, I mean, sitting outside a, a store for weeks just waiting for some guy to maybe show up. Right. That's kind of what you did with me. Yeah, I did stalk you a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I am obsessed with you. I'm not. What, you what are you doing here at this store? I always happy to be here. Yeah. Like every time, it's adorable. <laughs> and now, the Box of Oddities brings you that thing in the middle. It's well known that U.S. presidents have been dog lovers, many even having dogs while living in the White House. Most, in fact, have had dogs or cats, sometimes a guinea pig or two. But occasionally a president comes along that's a little out of step and has a more unusual pet. It's been said that James Buchanan, the 15th president, kept a herd of elephants on the White House lawn. The truth is, Buchanan was offered a herd of elephants by King Rama IV of Siam, though the letter speaking to the generous offer arrived after Buchanan's departure from office. As Buchanan's successor, Lincoln declined the king's offer, citing the unsuitable climate. Theodore Roosevelt and family had many pets during their lifetimes and were well known to be great animal admirers. During Roosevelt's time as the leader of the U.S., the world learned of the family's many White House pets. Bill was a gift to President Roosevelt from Emperor Menelik of Ethiopia. Some sources say that Roosevelt did grow fond of this particular hyena and allowed him to live in the White House for a time, begging for scraps from the dinner table and even teaching Bill tricks. In the end, though, Bill was sent to live out the remainder of his days at the National Zoo. Andrew Jackson once bought an African gray parrot named Pole for his wife. According to the Tennessean, when the first lady died, the parrot spent a lot of time with old hickory and apparently soaked up some of the president's choice phrases. When Jackson died in 1845, thousands of people gathered to pay a final tribute, along with one talking parrot that was apparently riled up by the crowds. The Reverend William Menefee Normant, who presided over the funeral, described the bird as letting loose perfect gusts of cuss words. So many that people were horrified and awed at the bird's lack of reverence. In the end, the bird refused to shut up and had to be carried away from the house. Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president, had a raccoon named Rebecca that walked on a leash. She had been sent to the White House to be served for the 1926 Thanksgiving dinner. Since the 1913 death of Horace Vost, the traditional provider of the White House Thanksgiving turkey, numerous farmers had been angling to provide the president's Thanksgiving meal. And despite Coolidge's requests to stop the practice in 1923, the unsolicited gifts continued and became increasingly unusual, with the live raccoon being the furthest out of the ordinary fare. Coolidge, who had never eaten raccoon and had no appetite to try it, kept Rebecca as a pet instead. 
President Benjamin Harrison and his wife Caroline had several dogs running underfoot during their time at the White House, but they, like many other presidents, had a few non-traditional pets as well. Chief among them were two opossums named Mr. Reciprocity and Mr. Protection. Harrison gifted the two opossums to his grandchildren. They were well loved by the Harrison family and could often be found seen running around the White House. During an 1825 tour of the United States, French revolutionary hero, the Marquis de Lafayette visited the White House. He had an unusual gift for the president, John Quincy Adams, an alligator. Adams decided to lodge the reptile in the then unfinished East Room of the White House, which had its own tub. According to White House legend, he would freak out unsuspecting visitors on tours of the residence by showing them into the room with the alligator. The Box of Oddities with Cat and Jethro Gilligan-Toth. All right, I want you to picture yourself in the oh, heart of Central okay. Asia. 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 Surrounded by the vast expanse of the Aral Sea, nestled within its waters lies Barsa Kelms, once the largest island in the region. Now, it's a desolate landscape now. It's barren. It's unwelcoming. And there's all kinds of ancient folklore from this area. Fun. Barsa Kelms known as the Island of No Return in the local tongue, has captured the imagination of adventurers and researchers and, of course, conspiracy theorists uh, yeah. for centuries. It's isolated and it has an eerie reputation that's made it a magnet for curious people seeking to unravel the secrets. What lies beneath the surface? of this island. There's some weird stories associated with it. Now, let's start with the basics. It was once a formidable presence in the Aral Sea, stretching 23 kilometers long and 7 kilometers wide. But don't let the size fool, fool you. This island was, was no paradise. It was rugged terrain and unforgiving. The climate was, was very harsh. It was a place that few people would go on purpose. Okay. Legend has it that it earned... Suddenly, I very much want to go there. <laughs> like, well, I want to see. It got his ominous uh, moniker from the countless tales of those who did venture there, but never returned. Families would vanish without a trace, leaving behind only whispers. Some spoke of entire caravans disappearing into thin air, their tracks vanishing as if swallowed by the desert sands. But the tales of terror surrounding Barsak Helms don't stop at uh, mere disappearances. There's a whole lot more that's been going on there over the, uh, well, centuries. Okay. Now, families vanishing into thin air, that's, that's enough for me. That's upsetting. Yeah. It's very yellow brick road. Yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> but there's something more sinister lurking in the shadows. Legends. <laughs> Talk of a giant sea serpent or sea serpents, plural, lurking in the lurking in the murky water of the uh, Aral Sea. Locals swore they had seen these giant sea monsters with their own eyes, and their slimy scales glinting in the sunlight as they they moved with some sort of, I guess one would say, grace. Magical pleiadodon, pleiad, pleiad. How is it said? Pleiad. Magical. My brain's broken. I'm too nervous. I'm sweating. And then there were reports of sightings. Reports started to flood in of strange lights dancing in the night sky, illuminating the barren landscape with an eerie glow. And some claimed... Uh, they were nothing more than tricks of the mind, the result of long nights spent alone on a desolate island. And That'll do it. Sure, I guess that would be one explanation. But others insisted there was something more, something other world, worldly. They spoke of, of course, UFOs hovering over the island. Mm -hmm. Their sleek metallic forms. Uh, viewed by many witnesses, they swore up and down that they had seen them. Their strange shapes twisting and turning in the night. 
But perhaps the most bone-chilling were the tales of sightings of a prehistoric lizard. Yeah. Leoplurodon. I figured it out. There you go. Yes, but they call it the devourer of souls. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A little more intimidating. It's a creature straight out of the nightmares with uh, razor sharp teeth and eyes that glowed in the darkness. And according to legend, it would stalk its prey through the barren landscape, uh, its form weaving through the shadows with deadly precision. And those unlucky enough to encounter it were never seen again. And their screams were not heard because it's a very windy place. So. Well, the, the, the winds howl over the desolate plains, my love. Now, I know what you're thinking. It all sounds like something out of a not-so-good horror movie. But uh, for people who live there, these tales are all too real. They've told them around campfires. They've shared them from generation to generation. The horrors that lurk just beyond the horizon on the island. There are also accounts of encounters with living uh, pterosaurs, creatures thought to have been extinct. Really? In, in 1959, in fact, an article detailing such an encounter sent shockwaves through the scientific community. Although further research, they were never able to find him. Okay, but they, they did have reports of it and apparently a picture. There's a picture? That's what they say. I have not been able to find it. It was from a 1950s article. Yeah. It's I would say probably that's a hoax. But then there's this guy. His name is Timur. Oh, my God. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to pronounce his last name because it's mostly consonants. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to call him Timur. Sure. He found himself involved in a tale that defied explanation. Uh, he was no stranger to the sea, the Aral Sea. He'd spent years navigating its treacherous waters, Arr. Arr, braving the elements in search of adventure, but nothing could have prepared him for what he encountered on one particular day in the late 1980s. Was it Wham? Yes, he was woken up before he had to go-go. I'm sorry, I was just listening to some Wham this morning, so kind of top of mind. So as he sailed toward the island, his curiosity was piqued by its reputation as being mysterious, and he spotted something strange on the horizon. It was a dark shape that loomed in the distance. Its outline was blurred by the shimmering heat haze that hung over the water. He was intrigued by it. You know what this m makes me think of? What? Lost. Yeah. Right? Abandoned okay. island, smoke monster kind of guy. Lots of unexplained stuff. Yeah. Ho hopefully the ending of this story won't be as disappointing as, as the We will see. <laughs> anyway, he steered his vessel closer to see what this was. He's of course. Uh, quote, very excited about uh, and intrigued and probably a little scared. He, he was prepared to uncover the island's secrets, but what he found would haunt him for the rest of his days. Mm -hmm. What he found was a sprawling complex of buildings that rose from the barren landscape. What? Their metal frames glinting in the sunlight. It was like nothing that he had ever seen before. It appeared to be some sort of secret military base, but it was hidden in plain sight. Was he hallucinating? He says no. He said it was, it was there. It was something that he had never seen there before. His heart raced. He, got, he actually got onto the island, and he explored the base. His senses, of course, on high alert as he uh, searched for clues to its origins. It was completely abandoned, but it seemed modern. The more he uncovered, the more questions arose. Who built this place and why? And what were they hiding behind the fortified walls? But as night fell and the shadows grew, his sense of unease did as well. And uh, he knew he was going to have to leave to escape the island before, um, you know, he got eaten by a dinosaur. And so, under the cover of darkness, he slipped back onto his ship and set sail for his house, his home. His mind racing with thoughts of what he had just seen. So, he tells his family and friends about it. And the next day they go. And he's eager to share his discovery with the world. But when he got there, 
the base was gone. Mm -hmm. Vanished without a trace as if it had never existed at all. He were high. <laughs> he looked high and low, scoured the site for any signs of, a, of the mysterious complex, but it was nowhere to be found. It was as if the island itself had just kind of swallowed it whole, leaving it behind. Um, to this day, his encounter remains one of the greatest mysteries of this island. It's certainly an intriguing glimpse into the uh, mysterious past and history of the island. Was the base real or was it simply a trick of light? He says he touched the buildings. He got up and walked, walked among them. What would have been inside the walls? Ergot, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> it was Ergot. One thing's for certain, though. Barca Kelms will continue to captivate the imaginations of those who dare to seek out its secrets, forever shrouded in mystery and um, intrigue. And the thing about this particular element, the vanishing base. There was a time travel story. It's pretty well known where a guy was, he was flying, I think it was around World War II. And he was in, you know, a typical type of plane for the time. Yeah. Wings. Yep. Yeah, with uh, propellers. And, yeah. Skinny guys. And so he's trying to go back to his base to land. And when the fog clears, the base is there, but he doesn't recognize anything. All of the uh, planes on the runway were like from the future. They had they were jet airplanes. They had Interesting. not been invented or deployed yet. And so he made another pass and he came back and it was the correct time again. It was like he hit some kind of a time slip. And I'm wondering if it's something something like that. Oh, you don't think that maybe like he just was dehydrated from being on the sea and then... No, it's pretty much time travel. Oh, okay. It seems more realistic to me. Cool. Okay, okay, okay. I got my information from the Smithsonian, BBC, and CNN. Well, that was interesting. Yeah. yeah. Is that a place you want to go? Yeah. Doesn't seem like a lot's going on there. <laughs> well, hey, look, you, you say that, but you get there and you're attacked by a pterosaur. And then what happens? You just bought these pants. Right. You know, for, yeah. for travel. Action pants. First time you've worn them, you step on an island. You haven't even zipped the bottom part of the leg off. And then the pterosaur eats your lower torso. Should have worn cheaper pants. Is Haggis licking his balls again? Haggis. I would say at least twice a week one of us does it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we, it's, call um, him, we call him we call Lukey Haggis. Oh my God. Well, yeah. you know Okay, shake it off. Okay. Let's let's move forward, shall okay. we? Okay. Yeah. The Order of the Poor Clares. Also just known as the Poor Clares, is a Catholic religious organization for women. The order follows the principles of Francis de Assisi. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, I had to look up how to pronounce that, and I'm feeling pretty good about it, just <laughs> so you know. Um, so it focuses on a life of poverty, of prayer and contemplation. Members of the order are um, living a simple life. It's dedicated to prayer, community, and serving others. Now, the Order of the Poor Clares was started by a, a woman named Claire. Claire. I mean, that's not wildly surprising, but anyway, just hang with me. I love the name Claire, by the way. Me too. Claire, can we open Christmas presents now? St. Claire of Assisi in the 13th century. She was a noblewoman who embraced poverty after following St. Francis, and she led a group of nuns in a secluded life of prayer and penance. Claire was inspired by the teachings of St. Francis and his vow of poverty. In 1212, Claire left her wealthy family to follow this life of poverty and prayer, and she established the Order of the Poor Ladies, later renamed the Order of St. Claire. This became known as the Poor Clares, um, which I think is 
funny. Like it's just so. It sounds like a like a French pastry. <laughs> pork glaze. Yes, I'll, I'll have some pork glaze. <laughs> The order was officially recognized by the Pope in 1253, and they focused on this simplistic life. Uh, they followed the example set by St. Francis and St. Clair for years to come. The order expanded across Europe starting in 1218 with a monastery in a place that I also looked up, Perugia. Oh. Um, I had to do a lot of how do you pronounce and um, I kept getting that one guy who said, we are about to learn how to pronounce this name. It is a thing, and I'm going to tell you about it. Let's learn how to pronounce it together. Yeah, I like that guy. Me yeah. too. I, I don't like the pronouncenames.com I don't like that one much. either. No. no. Yeah. Um. Following Perugia, foundations popped up in Florence, in Venice, in Mantua. Um, Agnes of Assisi, Claire's sister, introduced the order to Spain, where major communities arose in Barcelona and Bourgeau. Today, the poor Claire's consist of over 20,000 sisters across 16 federations and 70 countries. They've got a huge representation all over the world, and uh, they have various monasteries within various geographical boundaries. They live in these convents together, dedicated to a life of prayer, contemplation, service. The communities are often located in quiet environments to help meet their need for quiet contemplation, blah, blah, blah. You get it. These monasteries are typically closed, meaning that the sisters live within the confines of the monastery and they have limited contact with the outside world. It's not quite as dramatic as the the nuns who live here in El Centro who never come out of their convent. Although the the place that sells the juice. Yeah. Yeah, they make a special type of holy juice. Yeah, it's like flower water. And when you go to buy it, they have some kind of a weird little turnstile. Yeah, like a swoopy window so that they don't have to actually look at you. Yeah. You can't see them. But you can still get your flower juice. I want one of those. Give me my pizza. Yeah. So the some poor Claire's communicate um, with the outside world when it comes to things like public service. Um, they might engage in various types of work to support themselves. Some are like crafty. Some might bake or garden. And it really depends on the community that, that they live in. One such community is in Bruges. Bruges. Is in Bruges, in Belgium. Bruges. The sisters of the Order of Poor Clares had resided in the convent in this charming city for 600 years. In 1985, endorsed by a protege of a local bishop, the convent hired a man named Ronnie Crabb which to me is not a very trustworthy name, but uh, they, they liked Ronnie. He transitioned into this kind of jack-of-all-trades type guy. He drove them around. Um, he was their fixer-upper. He was their landscaper. And he started kind of sprinkling small joys into their life. They had all lived cloistered if you will. And so he introduced new things, brought them little presents from the outside world. Um, he wove his way, wove? No, he weaseled his way into their <laughs> inner circle. The nuns aged between 61 and 93 oh. eventually named him their maestro of weaselness, their financial kingdom as well. Uh, then around 88, the nuns discovered that their sanctuary, their convent, had been relegated by the bishop as a no new recruits convent. I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah. That meant that these eight nuns, these eight sisters, again, between the ages of 61 and 93, they were going to be the last recruits of this convent. 
Wow. So this obviously they're seeing a shortage of fresh blood in the convent. And uh, it, basically it was a it was a death note for the convent. They weren't going to introduce any new people in. Eventually these ladies were going to kick it and that was going to be it. As a bid, a do, the convent would be breathing its last breath and all of the items in the convent and the convent itself would go back to the diocese. This is sacred relics. These are artifacts that have been part of this convent for, as I said, 600 years. That's crazy. And the nuns are kind of freaking out about it. Mm -hmm. they, they heard it through the grapevine. And so the bishop didn't know that the nuns knew. The nuns, yeah, it was a whole thing. So these irreplaceable artifacts, these sacred relics, they were basically just going to go back to the diocese. And the nuns thought this was some bullshit. So since their convent operated as a nonprofit entity, the nuns leveraged this status and amended the bylaws so that they were the rightful proprietors and they could do with the convent and its fillings as they wanted without the diocese's blessing. Smart. Now, this is all assisted by Ronnie Crabb, who's like, yeah, I'm mowing the lawn, but also, you know, we could do. <laughs> <laughs> so Crabb's lawyer later said the nuns opted to redirect the convent's proceeds to their families. They figured they'd been serving this convent for all this time. And if it was going to die, if it, this whole shebang was going to kick the bucket, that their families should benefit from their work, their dedication, their devotion, blah, 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 rather than just go back to the church. Because who does that benefit? Just the church. So... Specifically, Sister Josephine was aware of the bishop's ban on new entrants and said, why should we allow it to wither away and let the diocese reclaim all of the assets? So with the guidance of financial advisor Ronnie Crabb, the nuns initiated the sale of their priceless, art, priceless artworks and sacred artifacts. According to reports in the French media, the tension between the nuns and the bishop was widely acknowledged. It was, quote, an open secret. And so it came as no shock when the bishop was furious learning what these nuns were doing, that they were slowly selling off. Did, did they put all this stuff on a blanket in the yard and have like a nun yard sale? You know, I don't know exactly how they sold it. I pictured like a Facebook marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. We have this really nice chalice. So the bishop went to the convent to talk to Mother Superior, Sister Anna, and he assured her that the church would look after the nuns for the rest of their lives. And they didn't have to worry about the convent not being a thing. They were going to be taken care of. Don't worry about it. But it was too late. The nuns had already secured buyers in a textile consortium and had already discreetly unloaded their convent for a handsome sum of $1.4 million. And this was what year? Uh, 88. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. So the bishop's pissed, and he insisted, you've got to cancel this sale, right? And the nuns are like, sorry, I can't. This is not an option. Um, Mother Superior, Sister Anna, she's 61 at the time. She stands her ground. She's got unwavering resolve, and she and her fellow sisters declared their intentions to move to the south of France, leaving the bishop with no recourse. Wow. These ladies. <laughs> That's a story. Again, I'm going to reiterate, it's eight nuns. From the ages of 61 to 93. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Ronnie Crabb. And Ronnie Crabb. After accumulating their wealth, the nuns, who had lived their entire lives meagerly, dove headfirst into a spending spree. They purchased a dilapidated castle in southern France. Um, they bought a Cadillac Seville and six Mercedes sedans. <laughs> <laughs> 
They also secured an ambulance for Sister Agnes, the 93-year-old, the oldest uh, nun, um, to accompany them on their journey to their new abode. So none of them had a driver's license, but they they bought six Mercedes. None of the nuns. No, no. Um, They cruised in style, though. Uh, They rode to their new chateau in a $110,000 Mercedes limousine. (laughs) Then they bought 11 racehorses. What? What? Then they bought 11 racehorses. 11? 11. So, refusing to concede defeat, the bishop enlisted an ally who shared his apprehension about the nun's departure. It was the youngest nun, and she felt that Ronnie Crabb had taken advantage of these ladies, that he had manipulated them, that he had charmed them, and she was kind of helping the bishop in challenging the sale of the convent, citing lack of Vatican approval, and it stirred quite a legal debate. So, The law enforcement launched an inquiry and filed a complaint against Crabb, leading to his arrest in February of 1990. Crabb's lawyer contended that the lavish spending of (laughs) the nuns was not because of his influence, but rather the nuns' own desires, that they had lived so frugally for so long, and they really liked horses. So he (laughs) described the nuns as being mentally sound and highlighted each nun's willingness to sign the agreement to sell the convent. Each one had signed it. And that was in the presence of a notary. So everything was legal. In late February of 1990, Belgian authorities, after the nuns had departed, arrived in the south of France for questioning. And some believed that the church had influenced the police to pursue this criminal case to reclaim the sold goods. The bishop, though, maintained that their primary concern was the nuns' welfare. Uh Curiously, though, after... Spending over a month in pretrial detention, the charges against Crab were abruptly dropped when the sale of the convent was reversed and it was returned to the church. Okay. So, without resources now, because the, the money was revoked, the nuns faced a financial crunch and they had to part ways with their beautiful new French villa within a year of settling there, Aww. which is unfortunate because each one of the nuns talked about how much closer to God they felt in this French villa than they did in the convent. They felt like they were actually able to see and experience the joys that God provided for them rather than being all closed up. Interesting. So they, in November of 1990, resettled in Belgium, acquiring a villa near Antwerp. In the meantime, the criminal courts persisted in pursuing Crab. Initially, he was summoned in May of 1993 on charges of breach of trust and assault and battery. And then charges escalated a month later to include forgery and use of forgery and fraud. Now, the some of these charges were dropped and um, he was able to kind of get out of a lot of it. And it, once the convent was returned to the church, a lot of those charges just kind of disappeared. Uh. But um, it was revealed during the trial um, that did commence that Crabb had authored a book about his life in the convent and sold the rights for a movie adaptation. So some people thought that his whole vibe was about figuring out how to make money on this. And some people thought that he was really about seeing that these nuns lived some sort of life where they felt something. Well, if, if he was there to defraud them, wouldn't it stand to reason that he would have carved out a chunk of that million plus dollars for himself somehow? It did appear as though he may have skimmed some of it. Skimmed some of it. Yes. Oh. It appears that way. All right. But not enough so that the ladies couldn't buy 11 racehorses. I mean, he 
had paperwork he had to pay for. That's and, true. You know, and then there's the cost of gas. Mm-hmm. For the limousine. Right. So, yep. yeah, that's reasonable. Okay. So, though many of the charges have been dropped, Crabb continued to try to clear his name and eventually tried his hand in politics, which absolutely tracks. So... The church ended up getting most of their stuff back and they're kind of chill now. And Crab is moving on with his life and, you know, trying to get into public office. Most of the nuns moved to this Antwerp village, so they're doing okay. Um, They're not doing 1.4 million okay. Right, right. Sister Anna, Mother Superior, ended up bidding farewell to convent life and decided to move in a whole different direction. She embarked on a fresh new chapter with Giamine Lombrecht. Did she open a brothel? No. Giamine was the young nun who had actually uh, worked with the bishop trying to unravel this whole thing. Okay. Um, But of course... Mother Superior is a nun, so she forgave her. Um, And uh, they, uh, in love, decided to embrace retirement together, settling down in a farmhouse by a stream in the beauty of Arden. Oh, shut up. And now they live together. (laughs) That is beautiful. It's so sweet. What a story. I know. And that's kind of the end is just, all right. Good place to end it. I think so. Wow. There's race horses. There's a lesbian love affair between nuns. And a beautiful stream. And a beautiful stream. All of the things, all the trappings of a successful screenplay. It does sound kind of like a movie. I got my information from sbfranciscans.org, Britannica, and the LA Times. Amazing. (laughs) Well, we got through that. Just barely. The uh, the very first video version of the box of oddities. And uh, I'm going to take a look at it uh, and see if it uh, came out okay before we promise that <laughs> it'll be uploaded. But uh, it will hopefully be on YouTube very, very, very soon. Um, thanks for hanging out with us, as always. And again, I, I want to point out, and you're, you know, if you're listening to this uh, audio version, you probably have the the idea that uh, everything for you is going to stay the same. And that's true. We're not going to stop producing no. simply the audio version. We're just adding a video version as well. Correct. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Until then, keep flying that freak flag. Fly it proudly, you beautiful freak. <laughs>